Hello, welcome back. An entirely new lecture, uh, Min Zhao's Chapter 9, Negotiating Culture and Identity. So welcome, okay? Again, this one will be chunked into three parts as well um, for uh, learners so they won't, uh, they won't be overwhelmed, okay? All right, so Min Zhao, a Negotiating Culture and Identity, Intergenerational Relations in Chinese Immigrant Families. All right, so usually if I was my, my usual class, right, of 45 students, I'd ask the question, who lives at home, right? That, I'd ask that, right? Um, who lives in a nuclear family? And nuclear family is defined as a mom, a dad, and just the kids, right? So invariably at Cal Poly here, actually, we have a lot of people who have mixed families who live together and actually who live with grandparents, who live with um, aunts and uncles, okay? So in, in that case, in looking at the immigrant family, in particular looking at the Asian American family, and in particular looking at the Chinese American family, which is so similar to, I think, Latino American families, uh, you have a different family structure than the basic nuclear family, okay? So there's pros and cons. So take out a sheet of paper and write down what are the pros of living with your mom and dad? Right on the other side, put the cons. What's the cons of living with your mom and dad? Okay, so sometimes people say pros, it is free, okay? And cons is you gotta like actually have to interact with your parents all the time and they kinda like still think of you as kids, right? So the pros and cons, uh, I can, I'm sure you can write, write, you're writing right now a long list of what's good and bad about living with your parents, okay? So this is what it talks, it's about, this is what the chapter talks about. How, in a sense, living with your parents is kind of like conflict, right? But then you cope and then you reconcile, right? You, you understand like what is the difficulty and you kind of like get through it, okay? So we have Confucian values and these Confucian values dominate most of East Asia and have affected the USA, uh, Asian American population, okay? Now, right now I want you to go and turn to page 187. So open your Min Zhao, Contemporary Chinese American Issues, and turn to page 187. I want you to highlight that part, highlight it, and read it to yourself. Uh, and w when you're reading it, it's basically about Confucian values, okay? And so in Confucian values, um, kind of patriarchal, it says what? Well, he says that you have to follow three people in your life, you're a woman. You follow your father in your youth, uh, your husband in your adulthood, and in your elderly age, you follow your oldest son, okay? So pretty interesting. I, I think a lot of the, the women right now are listening going, what the bleep? That's a full of BS, right? But again, uh, this is a kind of a common uh, Confucian value that's uh, followed. Um, and changing though, and changing. Like some people follow, some people don't. Um, it's really difficult to say a mass generalization for 1.3 billion people or actually half the global population is Asian. So again, you really can't do any kind of, um, any kind of a mass statement. It's some people follow it, some people don't. All right, so do you agree with your parents' wills, okay? Uh, think about your mom and dad. Do you agree with everything that they tell you, okay? So the first one, if you don't, if you don't f uh, agree with everything that your mom and dad tell you, tells you, then you might have some sort of like conflict, right? And the second world, the second thing that this, this chapter talks about is living in two worlds, right? On one hand, you live at home, which is not this atypical, right? Uh, traditional American families at age 18, you kind of move out, right? But in America, you kind of, um, uh, in Asian America, or a particular ethnic people of color, students of color, you kind of live with your family, right? So you kind of like, which goes against like the norm, right? So you're kind of living in two worlds, and these two worlds can be jarring, right? Uh, that she talks about. So for instance, let's say right now, and write down where you live, okay? Do you live in an ethnoburb, which is a suburb that's primarily ethnic minorities, such as, let's say, Monterey Park, okay, if you're talking about here, or High Sena Heights around here? Or do you live in an ethnic enclave? An ethnic enclave means it's basically a city. It's a city that has mostly ethnic groups. I'm thinking specifically of Chinatown. That's what I'm thinking of, okay? And, um, and attending an ethnic institution, okay? For instance, Chinese schools. Did you go to Chinese schools, okay? So basically, if you do these, if you live in these places, everyone is what? Everyone is mostly Chinese and Latino or Asian Latino. So if you actually go to these ethnic institutions, you live in these ethnic enclaves or ethnoburbs, really it's not as jarring, right? It's not as jarring because, you know, everyone surrounding you has that same kind of like cultural milieu. They know exactly what you're talking about when you say, hey, you know what, I go to Chinese school. 
after like, okay, yeah, sure, everyone goes to Chinese school. Or hey, you know, let's get some boba, you know, at you know, on the and the six two six. Everyone does that. It's well known. So if you live in that type of background, right, then it's like less jarring, right? But again, many Asian Americans uh, did not grow up like this. I, I find this very fascinating, and interesting, actually, because I grew up in the West. I was the only Asian person in my entire city. So I, I find this interesting. This whole concept of living in a place where everyone looks like you and has these like social norms. So it's like fascinating. So if you live in there, you one of my students is like, yeah, it's pretty easy living here. And some people are like, I want to live here forever, right? And some people are like, I want to get out of here. Okay, so it's really interesting. A uh, very, uh, very significant in terms of looking at uh, how you are interpolated how you are, right? If your identity changes, if you do live in an ethnic enclave. All right, so let's look at the Chinese Americans, old generation and the new generation of Chinese Americans, okay? Now, Chinese Americans are both the oldest and the newest ethnic groups in, in the United States, right? So we talked about in 1848, we had all these Chinese coming in. And, you know, they, they kind of died in a very uh, sad light because most of them were bachelor society and they couldn't come back to China. And, uh, of course, many were killed during the uh, massacres. Uh, but, you know, so they really can reproduce. So they're kind of the oldest, one of the oldest groups, but also the newest. There's Chinese people coming in 2013, right? quite wealthy, they have a half million dollars, they buy a house, etc. that will get you a green card, uh, start a business, okay? So again, you have the oldest and also the newest ethnic groups are Chinese, okay? Now, the Chinese came to U.S. from where in China, right? Mostly from Guangdong, southern China, and these Ch Chinese built railroads that was, uh, there was, of course, intense ra racism towards them, nativism directed towards them, okay? So now, um, actually for our class, we're going to have, um, usually for my class, and we'll see if we can ha have it for this class. But all my classes, I take them to a museum, all of them, right? It's for kinesic learners, and it's a really good thing. And obviously, our class is called Chinese Ethnic Identity, so why wouldn't we go to the Chinese American Museum, right, where they had these, like, uh, massacre. We walk around, we see, like, where this happened. Uh, so again, um, so I want you to think about that, and maybe we can do it for our class. We'll see. In 1882, there was a Chinese Exclusion Act we talked about last class, okay? So now let's take a break, and I will see you to the second and third part of this lecture.